Thank you for joining us today and hearing about the Cleveland Clinic's journey towards value-based care. I'm here with our Chief of Population Health, Dr. Adam Myers, and our Associate Chief for Value-Based Operations, Dr. Nira Vakaria. I'm Michelle Medina. I'm the Associate Chief for Clinical Operations of our Population Health Unit, known as Cleveland Clinic Community Care. So how did we do this? When we launched Community Care in 2017, we considered three questions around how can we make population health real for our system? The first is, how do we leverage data? The second, what types of investments should we make in our primary care workforce? And the third, how do we engage patients in the community in this work? So let's review each one. A robust data set is key to population health management. It allows our teams to identify the care opportunities that can move populations towards more optimal health outcomes. No longer are we confined to the data we see when patients come see us for their care, but we need to understand what is actually happening to them beyond our four walls. After all, in this model, we are responsible for those who come see us, as well as those who do not. This means bringing together all of our internal data sets, along with all the data coming in from outside, such as payer or public health information. The intent is to use that data to drive specific interventions that impact the care, experience, and outcome of each patient depending on their identified need. For healthy patients, this may mean reminders for wellness visits and prevention strategies, such as smoking cessation. For high-risk patients, those with multiple and complex conditions, we deploy high-touch care coordination, consider home-based services, and enroll them in special clinics. The results have meaningful clinical and financial implications. For the sickest patients, this means fewer days in the hospital and fewer reasons to go to the emergency room. For patients managing a chronic disease in their daily lives, it is the difference between an active lifestyle and a stroke or premature death. Nirav, can you describe how the different analytic teams are organized within value-based operations? Absolutely. So Michelle, as you mentioned, when we first launched community care in 2017, we had an opportunity to really think through our data and analytics strategy. Mm -hmm. And where we started from was saying there were really a couple of issues we wanted to solve. The first was that we looked around and we saw we had lots of data, mm -hmm. lots and lots mm -hmm. of data, but we weren't necessarily using those data effectively mm -hmm. to drive the kinds of care improvement yes. outcomes that you described. Yeah. The second is that in many cases, even though we had lots of data, it wasn't necessarily the right data. Mm -hmm. And if we are really going to help patients promote wellness and prevent illness, mm -hmm. we required some other points or data points in order to uh, be able to make these proactive decisions. And so we organized our teams around trying to solve for those two problems. Uh, first and foremost, any operational team that we created, we made sure that there was an analytics partner. And it wasn't just someone who could provide a spreadsheet of the data that was needed, but also was someone who could help the team understand mm -hmm. and be in a relationship as opposed to a transaction around what sorts of data were needed to help solve their problems. Mm -hmm. And that has proved fruitful. Uh, we count sort of the, the new inquiries that come in from our caregivers or from our frontline teams mm -hmm. as a sign of success. When they want more data, we know that, mm -hmm. that uh, they're waking up to the opportunity. Mm -hmm. For the second issue, which was around, are there areas where we could collect different or more meaningful data? You know, historically in healthcare, we measured what we could. Mm -hmm. We measured uh, what happened in a given process. But if what really matters here is the outcomes that we're driving, we wanted to make sure we can move in towards measuring those. Mm -hmm. A lot of that required actually talking to patients directly and getting data from them. Mm -hmm. And so we instituted a variety of means for being able to, in an as unobtrusive of a way as possible, understanding what's their level of support in the home. Yes. And if it wasn't where they wanted it to be, it allowed us an opportunity to help fill the gap. Uh, we know that behavioral health concerns really impact one's ability to care for oneself. So we started to look at how do we understand that in a way that honors and respects patient privacy, but also allows us to really match the resources when there was a need. And so through the measurement of things like behavioral health, mm -hmm. social determinants mm -hmm. of health, and actual outcomes, like does someone feel better about their health after certain things that we've helped them manage, this is the data strategy that we are underway. I can't say it's perfect yet, but we're definitely moving in the right direction. And a lot of that has to do with making sure we measure what matters, not just measuring what we can. Thank you. And I think it's much appreciated by the frontline teams. For them, what this means in everyday practice is that they're now asking different questions at the beginning of the clinical workday. And the teams get to shape the work to best respond to those answers. If they know who might end up in the emergency room, then they can find a way to call them or bring them in. 
if they know who has trouble making appointments because of transportation, then let's all figure out how to get them the assistance. Which brings us to the next key consideration, the primary care workforce. The U.S. has historically underinvested in primary care, again, because it largely operated on a fee-for-service track. Compared to other developed countries who spend 14% of all of their healthcare spending on primary care, the U.S. spends half of that, about 7% on primary care. This has led to a growing shortage of primary care physicians, outstripped by the growing demand equally of an aging population, with more chronic disease, and with higher consumer expectations for service. It is not surprising then to see higher rates of physician burnout. Physician and caregiver burnout have tremendous impact on access, quality, and safety, especially when physicians leave practice or feel like that their practice has become depersonalized. Even among our patients, they have raised a concern that the long hours and the huge work demands may lead to their own physician's burnout. So what can we do? Numerous studies show that physicians who continue to see meaning in their work, who believe they add value to the patient's care, and who feel that their values align with the organization, report less burnout. At Cleveland Clinic Community Care, not only are we growing the primary care physician group, but making investments in the overall workforce through the following ways. One, developing the team that surrounds the patient, which includes physicians, advanced practice providers, nurses, MAs, care coordinators, social workers, navigators, and health coaches. Second, ensuring that every member of the team is working at the top of their competency. Third, empowering the team with actionable real-time data. And last, creating the bandwidth within the day to address panel management either through time or improved efficiencies. In one publication, it is estimated that it will take one physician 21.7 hours during the day to take care of a patient panel of 2,500 patients. Clearly, it's an impossible task. Having a team surround the panel, each with defined tasks, ensures that every patient's unique needs are identified and addressed. Team behaviors, such as daily huddles, weekly panel man management meetings, create those efficiencies that allow the team to plan the workday. Patient registries and reports help identify which patients need the help of a pharmacist or a social worker or a behavioral health specialist or a navigator. With our new team access innovation, we are piloting even more ways to expand the physician's bandwidth by giving them focus time during the day to do the panel work leveraging distance health technology, and really optimizing the collaborative model between the physician and the advanced practice provider. We also have additional capabilities in the pipeline, which include home-based services for the frail and the high risk that is supported by virtualists and allied health professionals. We continue to collaborate with our emergency room and hospital medicine groups so that we have better transitions and are able to direct patients to the right venue of care. As we learned and expanded our capabilities to address a diverse and complex population, we also needed to align our payer strategy to enable and sustain this care model. Succeeding in a value-based world involves simultaneous attention to all the domains of quality, safety, productivity, utilization, and patient experience. The Cleveland Clinic is uniquely poised to be successful in this work because we are integrating our globally renowned specialty institutes and our new expertise at population health management within a medical neighborhood that now surrounds the patients that we jointly care for. The underpinnings of success are still the same values that are core to our organization. Deliver on evidence-based care that add value and consistency to the experience. Now this payer strategy segments our opportunities into two major buckets. First, by managing entire populations longitudinally within their primary care medical homes and ensuring timely access, good clinical outcomes, and promotion of wellness. The opportunity is to decrease the total cost of care of an entire population. Exemplifying this is our success at being a Medicare Accountable Care Organization, or ACO, which resulted in a significant reduction in medical expense. But for patients, this meant fewer unnecessary emergency room visits, fewer hospital days, and more touch points with their primary care team. The second opportunity involves organizing our many care teams to more effectively and efficiently deliver care within a defined episode, known as bundled payments. Bundled payments harness the evidence base to reduce variation and optimize the cost of delivery. As exemplified by our experience with stroke as an episode of care, 
Adherence to the care path not only lowers the cost of care, but reduces an important outcome for patients, which is eventual mortality. And finally, none of this work will ever be completely impactful nor sustainable if we do not also engage patients and their communities in the work. When we were designing episodes of care, our teams recognized that the patient's commitment to engage, bring their resources, stay educated, and manage their own risk is essential. Patients undergoing hip and knee replacements will not be able to go home safely unless they take that first step out of the hospital bed. Communities will see a reduction in obesity as a major predictor of chronic disease once they invest in the built environment of safe paths, nutritious food sources, and supportive circles of citizens. Adam, will you tell us how Cleveland Clinic is engaged in this important work of raising healthy communities? Absolutely. Traditionally, many health systems have viewed their responsibility at ending at their doors. That's no longer the case. We embrace our role as an, an anchor institution dedicated to strengthening the communities in which we live, work, and care. Anchor institutions live, buy, hire, and invest locally. What does that look like? Frankly, it takes partnership. Hospitals have a lot of laundry to do, for example, a lot of laundry. It's one thing that we all have in common. Several years ago, the Cleveland health systems, several health systems, uh, got together and decided that they could solve this problem in a fairly unique way. And they established and, and invested together in a community-owned laundry service that we all share and uh, get our laundry done at. It, it now prospers. Lives have been changed, employment has uh, been established, the funds flow here locally, and we have clean laundry. It is one of many examples, frankly, in our community where f what might otherwise be viewed as competitors are collaborating together. There are other examples to get that we could share, but this is just one about how we're making a difference together in the community. Thank you. And thank you all for your time and attention today. Coming up, we'll hear from Dr. Vakaria on the lessons that we've learned from this journey. <laughs>